why do we make New Year's resolutions to go to the gym and then we go for a week or two and then stop going? How do we get ourselves to put down our digital devices and stop being so attached to our email or, or to apps? How do we get ourselves or others to stick with prescription medications that we've been prescribed? These are some of the things we're going to talk about today in this Facebook Live event with the UCLA Health System. I am Sean Young. I'm Associate Professor here in the Medical School and the Executive Director of the Institute for Prediction Technology. I'm also a behavioral psychologist and uh, just released a new book called Stick With It, which talks about the science behind lasting change. And we're going to go over some of this science in today's presentation. Thanks everyone for joining. It's, uh, it's great to have UCLA running Facebook Live events like this. And what we're going to talk about is the psychology and the science behind how to get ourselves and others to stick with things that we want to do. This is a live event. You guys can all ask questions, please, on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. Uh, and you can chat at me, Sean Young, PhD, on Twitter and comment on Facebook. All right, so I love this, this picture up here, this image with the, the cat on the mountain. Is it, every time I see it, it makes me wonder if the photographer was another cat with a GoPro on it next to it. Now this, this image here and in the, the quote on top, the idea behind it that motivation, inspiration, and willpower are temporary feelings. The secret to sticking with something is to use a process you can follow no matter how you feel. I think that's important because what we're typically told or what we think is if we want to make change, if we want to make to stick to a New Year's resolution, we need to be inspired to do it. We need to be motivated. But motivation, inspiration, these are temporary things. On a day-to-day -day basis, it's really hard to be excited all the time to want to go to the gym, to want to uh, do things that are good for us. So we can't rely on motivation all the time. That's where we need a process to stick to. So why don't people stick to things that we know we want to be doing? This is such a common thing. The, the New Year's resolution example in the gym is, is such a common one where the gym is packed for the first two weeks of the New Year and then it empties out. Well, we're taught, since, since we don't have good solutions out there um, in, in the public, we're taught that the answer is to blame ourselves for the problem, to say we're not going to the gym or we're not taking medication because we're lazy or because we're not motivated or we're not disciplined. We're taught to blame ourselves. But blaming the person not only makes us feel badly about ourselves, but it's actually not the correct science. So instead of blaming the person, what we need to do, don't change the person. Don't, don't say, if you want to exercise, become like Richard Simmons who loves exercising, because we can't do that and, and that's not the right science. Instead of trying to change who we are as a person, we just need to change our process. And so we're going to go over today what that process is that can get ourselves and others to stick with things. So I found it's, it's a two-step process. This is based on research that I've done uh, over decades of, of psychology research as well as in my own research with research participants, with patients, and even applied this in my own life. So I found that behaviors aren't all the same. We can't treat every behavior the same. What we need is, there's a two-step process. First step is identify whether the behavior you want to change is what I call an A, B, or C behavior, which is an automatic, burning, or common behavior, and we'll go over that in a minute. So first figure out, is the behavior you're trying to change an A, B, or C behavior? And then second, there's a set of tools that we can use, or forces as they call them, that 
can be used to change A, B, and C behaviors. And so if we know what type of behavior we're trying to change, then we can figure out what tools we need from this behavioral toolkit to help us change our behaviors. So let's, let's start with A behavior, the first type of behavior. A behaviors are automatic behaviors. These are behaviors that are done automatically without our awareness. Um, the example of, of uh, someone, if you've ever had someone who interrupts you, that may be an automatic behavior. They may not even be aware that they're interrupting you. Um, forgetting to stand up straight, that's an automatic behavior. Things that we're, we're not aware that we're doing are automatic behaviors. Second type of behavior are burning behaviors. Burning behaviors are, are things that we're aware that we, that we should be doing or that we shouldn't be doing, but we feel like we can't stop. So being connected to digital devices and feeling dependent, feeling like I have to check my email right now, that's a burning behavior. I know that I shouldn't be doing it. Um, I can try to stop, but I feel like I have to do it. The third type of behavior are common behaviors. And this is a, a picture of my brother. Um, this is a, a personal example. My brother has Crohn's disease, and, and through years he was, he was advised, change his lifestyle, change the way he eats, change his exercise, get him to, to take better care of his mental health, meditate. And it's really difficult to find time to be able to do that. It's really difficult um, because other things come up that are priorities, it's hard to stay motivated. And so these types of things, um, like lifestyle changes or like getting ourselves to go to the gym, these are examples of C behaviors or common behaviors. Now the reason why it's important to know the difference between these types of behaviors is because there's a different set of tools that we can use for changing them. So just as uh, you may have learned in, in physics that there are, there are physical forces that get people to, uh, that get objects to move, so physical forces move objects. Well, there are behavioral forces that move people. They get us to behave in different ways. There are seven of these forces that I've identified. Uh, and we need to be aware of these forces because they can help us to be able to keep doing things we want to do. I created a model called science where each one of the letters of science is a different one of these seven forces or tools that we can use to change behavior. I called it science not because you need to be a, a scientist or a doctor to understand them, but because they're rooted in decades of scientific research and, and in our own work um, with research participants and patients also. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through very quickly, we don't have much time, but I'll, I'll go through and tell you what each of the letters stands for and give a, a quick background, a, a couple sentences on it. Uh, just to give you a feel for how to use these tools to change your own behavior. So first, S stands for step ladders. Step ladder is the idea that we should do things in small incremental steps. So I ran into, I ran into someone at the market and he was, he was a, a cross country runner in high school. He trained, he ran cross country, but it had now been about 15 years or so since then. And, and what he had decided to do is, I'm going to go run a marathon, he said. But he hadn't trained for the marathon. He just figured, I know how to run. I was a cross-country runner, so I'm going to go do this marathon. And he got to mile 19, really impressive, I think. <laughs> got to mile 19, 19 without training, then he collapsed, fell on the ground. He said he didn't, couldn't finish the marathon. He said, didn't finish that marathon, and I'm probably never going to run a marathon again. So, I mean, that really resonates with me. It makes a lot of sense. I know I couldn't run a marathon without training for it for a long time. And so, so the example makes sense, but all of us make mistakes like that in our own life all the time with behaviors of, of things we want to do. The New Year's resolution example. We may say, you know, I didn't really exercise at all this year, 
But for New Year's resolution, I'm going to go to the gym five, six days a week for the entire year. Well, that's equivalent to him saying I'm going to run a marathon without having trained for it. What we need to do is break things up into small incremental steps. We need to train gradually. But how do we do that? I mean, I think the idea as I'm talking about this, the idea probably makes sense to you. It probably resonates. It's, it's intuitive, right? So if we already know or if it makes sense for us to do that, why aren't we doing it already? The answer is because we don't know what small steps mean. How do you know what small is? Small to some people may mean one thing and it may mean something else to someone else. So what I've done is I created a figure which is called Steps, Goals, and Dreams. And what I do is I quantify it into what is a step, what is a goal, and what is a dream. So in the case of running a marathon, if you have no training, uh, I call that a dream because it would take for me or for I think a lot of people months to be able to get to the point of running a marathon. It takes months of training. You can't just do it. So I call that a dream because it takes three months or more. Then there are goals. Goals are things that take uh, about a week to a few months, short and long-term goals. And then there are the day-to-day -day steps. Steps are things that take less than a week. So if I want to train for a marathon, maybe getting a pair of running shoes might be a first step if I don't even have running shoes. Um, maybe going for a walk if I, have no, if I have no experience exercising or going for a short run. Those are steps, things that we can do today. So this, this model can be used to help people use step ladders and get themselves to stick with things for a long term. I'll go through the, the other tools that we can use. So one of them is community. Community is the idea that our social environment, the people that are around us, they really influence what we do. Here at UCLA, we've created what's called the Harnessing Online Peer Education or HOPE Intervention, which is an online community designed to get people to change their behavior. And we found a lot of success with this online community. Um, we train peer role models to, to change people's HIV-related behaviors, to change people's uh, prescription drug and opioid-related behaviors, to help reduce chronic pain around patients. Uh, and we found that communities are a really, really important force in getting people to change their behavior and to stick with it. Next, I stands for important. If something's important to a person, they're going to be more motivated to do it. They're going to be more likely to stick with it. So if we can get people motivated, that'll go a long way in, in getting them excited and to continue doing it. And there are ways that we can increase people's motivation. But the interesting thing is we might think that if you're not motivated to do things, you're not going to do it. That's not true. There, there are seven of these forces up here, and important is only one of them. So we can use the other ones and still be able to get ourselves and to get others to stick with things that, we, that are important, even if it's not important to ourselves. Next, E stands for easy. This is, this is a, a really important tool. Easy is the idea that if something's easy for us to do, we're going to keep doing it. If it's difficult for us to do, we're not going to want to keep doing it, and it's going to be difficult for us to keep doing it. So we should make things as simple as possible for us to continue doing. Next, N stands for neurohacks. Now, neurohacks is the idea that there are quick mental shortcuts that we can use that can change our brain and allow us to think and behave in ways that we could never do before. Just like on a computer, if a program crashes, you can hit Control Alt Delete and reset and start the program, there are neurohacks that we can do which can change our brain and allow us to 
think and act in ways we never could before. How do we do it? Well, the conventional wisdom we're often taught tells us that if we want to make a change, we should think about it first. We should visualize the change. Um, if we want to, if we want to um, go to the gym more often, if we want to go for a run more frequently, visualize it and, and have the will and know that we can do it. But what science has shown is that it's actually the opposite. What neurohacks teach us is that if we want to make a change, first go do it. Go, go to the gym, go for a run. Once we start doing something, then our mind will realize, I can do this. And, and our mind will follow, and then our behavior will follow. That's the idea of neurohacks. Next, C stands for captivating. Captivating is the idea that we need captivating rewards for people um, to keep doing things. If we want to continue doing something, then it's got to be rewarding in a way that's important for us. There have been all kinds of rewards. There's been um, fads like the gamification fa fad is, is a recent one where um, we can give people points and badges to change their behavior or we can download apps that will reward us for it. But gamification doesn't work for everyone because not everyone cares about earning points or badges. So we need to make sure that rewards are captivating, that they're really important to us. Not any reward works. It needs to be one that's truly captivating. Finally, E stands for ingrained. If we can make something ingrained in our brain by making it a routine, will be more likely to stick with it. Um, you know, the, there are famous examples. Barack Obama was, was known for making a routine of the clothes that he wore and the food that he ate so that he could save time for making important decisions about the country. Um, Mark Zuckerberg was known for uh, wearing the same shirt. He had 20 versions of the same shirt that he'd wear. That would save time for him to, to be able to, to make other important decisions. If we can make a routine out of something, if we can exercise every day at the same time, if we can take our medication every day at the same time, we make it a routine, it becomes ingrained in our brain and easy for us to keep doing. Now, how do we, how do we know which of those seven forces to use and when? Well, here's a model that I created called the science of lasting change, where we have the three different types of behaviors, automatic, burning, and common behaviors. And then we have the forces needed to change each of those types of behaviors. So the more stars next to each of these forces, the more important it is to use it. And, and as you'll see, uh, in general, as behaviors get more complicated. So automatic behavior, there's uh, the figure with automatic, there's no brain inside because it's just done automatically. Burning behaviors, there's half a brain because we're somewhat aware of, of what we're doing. We have some control over it. Common behaviors, we're, we're fully aware of what we're doing and, and in control of it. So as behaviors get more complicated and we're more aware and in control of ourselves, more of these forces are needed to change it. Now I'm going to start wrapping up here uh, to come to a close. If the information, hopefully this was helpful for you today in, in changing your behavior. Um, I, I know I went through very quickly and so if you want more information about it, um, this is a, a book. I've just released this, this book that I wrote on the, the science behind this and you can get more information from the book. Now because I'm also a teacher, I can't leave here or can't leave you guys without giving a homework assignment to you. So what I'd like you to do is um, for, I want you to, to think about a behavior that you want to change in your own life and tell someone else, tell someone, tell a, a friend, a family member, a coworker, tell someone whether you think your behavior is in A, B, or C behavior and why. Second, um, write to me and tell me whether you think your behavior is in A, B, or C behavior. Um, you can tweet at me at Sean Young PhD. 
um, or you can, you can write to me. Uh, and I want you to, to tell me whether it's an A, B, or C behavior, and this will really help to solidify this and, and to help your understanding and, and let me know, and then I can help you from there and, and keep you on the track to determining what type of behavior it is and the tools to use it. Um, so I'll, I'll finish saying I'm a behavioral psychologist, and so the, the approach that we've used here is a behavioral science approach, um, a, a behavior change science approach. It's not a mental health approach, in, um, it's not a psychotherapy approach, but it's a behavioral approach because if, if we can change behavior, then we can address a lot of the problems that we have in behavior. So I'll, I'll finish off there and want to thank you guys for joining me and, and now I'm going to take some questions here and, and can answer some questions. I'm going to take a drink of water now. All right, thank you. Okay, so someone had a, had a question um, about the different forces. So the, the force of easy, uh, this is, I can elaborate on, on the force of easy. There's, actually I can elaborate with a personal example. I, I am in, I work in this office right now where I am. I'm in the Oppenheimer Tower, which is on Wilshire and Westwood. But I used to, I used to be up campus. Uh, and I used to be on campus and I went to the, the Wooden Center on campus, the, the gym on campus. And I was pretty dedicated. I, I love exercising and, and would go to the gym. But when I moved down to this office here, I stopped going to the gym as much and I stopped exercising as much. So why did, I, why did I stop doing that? Well, it's not because I lost motivation. It's not because um, I wasn't inspired or I was lazy. It was because suddenly now from working here to get up to Wooden, I would have to walk you know, 30, 40 minutes, walk up there, walk back or wait for the bus or shuttle to get up there and it suddenly became really inconvenient for me to be able to go to the gym. So, so I knew that this was a C behavior, a common behavior, and, and the easy was a really important tool, a force to be able to change this. So what I did, um, I now bring, first I change the gym where I, where I go to work out. I now work out, I join the gym right across the street. And I also bring my gym bag with me everywhere I go. So now when I leave work, as I'm walking on the way to the parking lot, I can't walk to my car without passing the gym and holding my gym bag. And it's almost to the point where it's, it's harder for me to keep walking than to just turn in and, and go to the gym. And so sometimes when I really don't feel like doing it, I'll tell myself, just walk in there, uh, just walk in and do five minutes of, of a workout and then I can leave. But five minutes turns into 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, and so I end up getting my workout. That's, that's one of the ways we can use the force of easy to make it easy for us to keep doing things. Just make it more difficult to not to do something than to do it. Uh, okay, what else do we have here? Um, so what do I enjoy most about my research? I got into this area because I wanted to help other people. Uh, that's, I was trained as a, as a psychologist, social psychologist, and I could have gone through the path of um, going to psychology and just um, learning about and studying psychological theory. I could have gone to the business school, but I moved to the medical school because I really wanted to work with patients and have an impact on people's lives and, and to help them. So what I enjoy most is hearing from people, hearing from patients, hearing from research participants that the work that we're doing really has changed their lives. And that, I mean on a personal note, that's why I feel like I'm here, why I'm living, and, and that's what's most inspiring. We do, we have our HOPE interventions, which I described briefly, which are, um, we train peer role models to change people's behaviors in, in different areas. And when we have these training sessions where we train the peer leaders, that's um, some of the, the best days of my research career where I get to 
interact with these peer role models who are going to go on and pass on our science and message to help the community and improve public health. Um, okay, I'll take, I'll take one, more, uh, one more question here. And that will be, um, how do we get ourselves, how do we get ourselves motivated? Um, I think part of that question, embedded within that question of how to get motivated is we often feel badly about ourselves if we're not doing, if we're not sticking with something. We feel like we need to be motivated all the time and if we're not sticking with, with our goals or our plans, then we feel badly. Well, that's the wrong way to think about things. It's the wrong science. We shouldn't be blaming ourselves, shouldn't be blaming who we are um, as a, a person. We just need a process for doing it. If we have the right process that's tailored to ourselves, we don't need to try to change who we are, which we shouldn't do. We just have, we have a process, we have tools that we can use and we can stick to no matter how we're feeling. So this, this process of, of identifying the type of behavior we're trying to change and then using those, the tools that are needed, that's a process that we can stick to no matter how we're feeling and we found in scientific studies that that gets people to stick with behaviors that they want to change. So I'm going to end off here. I'm wrapping up, coming up to the, the hour and, and just want to thank you guys again for having me here. I want to thank the health system and, and the, the office here for inviting me to give this talk. I think it's great that, that UCLA is, um, so much of our work is in digital media and, and spreading out. Um, and I'll give a shout out to our, our research participants who are there watching, to our peer leaders in our studies and our, our staff and, and everyone involved and say thank you. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>